wow, we are still going. So this is what it feels like to be on the internet. <laughs> Hello, I am Ricky. I'm Nat. And we are the Streaming Buds. All right, guys, before we jump into it, this is our first episode, so we kind of want to give you a description of what our show is about. The Streaming Buds is a podcast show that features two pop culture obsessed friends, that's Ricky and I, who explore the offerings of streaming platforms, ranging from widely known franchises to rarely talked about movies and shows, otherwise known as the hidden gems. This podcast originally ran as a radio show on Radio DePaul, the radio station of DePaul University. Ricky and I cover a wide variety of topics for both pop culture fanatics and casual viewers alike to enjoy. But for today's episode, we are going to talk about streaming services, the rise of and future of, potentially. There's so much to talk about it. And especially since like the last few decades from the 90s to even early 2000s, TV was the mainstream and it was where everyone got their shows and content from like even movies like it started becoming more home media and suddenly the internet started becoming a big giant thing gradually talk about that natalie what do you think about quibi we're gonna we're gonna start with quibi can i start with anything here i don't know if i want to start there or not we don't need to that was just a joke Okay, because <laughs> that is like a little speck in everything. <laughs> anyway, what do you think about streaming services overall, Natalie? I don't really know where to start with it because it's like at the same time, it's both good and bad. Like a lot of things in life, there's pros and cons to everything. I like to focus on the pros, like with streaming. Well, let's start with Disney Plus, for example. The vault is opened. If you think about like back in the day... A lot of the Disney classics were on like VHSs and, you know, a lot of people used to like really like getting those VHSs. And with the introduction of Disney Plus, yeah, it's it's becoming more accessible to a lot of people like those kinds of movies. Like, let's say you, you like never got a VHS and like for like Lion King, for example. Yeah. Now you can just go watch it whenever and you can have it on any sort of device. That's my pro with streaming services like it doesn't really just apply to Disney Plus. It goes for all of them. At the same time, though, actually owning the physical copies of things. That in and of itself is just so unique, that kind of feeling. Just knowing that you like own the movie or own the series. And with this rise with streaming services, you don't really get that anymore. And it's kind of sad. It breaks my heart. It's both good and bad. What about you, Ricky? Yeah, definitely. Something that I thought about the other day while watching... YouTube videos about Futurama. The YouTuber Johnny Two Tellos, he was more or less talking about a lot of things from the Futurama commentary and even like other Simpson podcasts as well, who talk about like all these nuggets that you get from it that you otherwise wouldn't have. And that made me kind of question like what is gonna happen with commentary in general from like episodes and stuff where people just mm -hmm. like start having podcasts, like Obviously, the nature of this show is only going to be visual media, but it's like what will happen to the extras that you kind of get from the perks of owning a DVD set. Also show like companies still put effort in these extras and will companies still mm -hmm. kind of have these nuggets of information of the creators. And like, it, yeah, it's scary to think about um, from that point that you mentioned, Natalie. But the major pro that I think that improves the media in general is that a lot of things are now accessible and a lot of people now want something on the platform. When we reviewed on Radio DePaul of News Radio, that was a very good show that not many people remembered fondly and like could only get either from physical media but luckily I have the DVD set now and you could also watch it on some other streaming services. The ones that you could watch it on aren't the mainstays like Krakow of all places. And yeah, so that's kind of what my thoughts. I'm just, but also um, kind of sad that extras won't exist in the future probably as it looks right now. Yeah, I get that definitely. With the Gravity Falls series set, I know they had a lot of commentary like with Alex Hirsch and all that. 
And the same for like regular show as well. Just like knowing like that there's extras out there. Like that's another perk of getting those like DVD sets and having those series, like the commentary and just maybe extra digital art. But I do have to say with the rise of streaming services, a part of me like really wants to get those DVD sets now. Like once they come out, it seems like extra special to have it now. Even though you can just pull it up on your phone or whatever, like just having this, yeah. the, just owning it, it's, there's just something about it. The same goes for music. And I seen somewhere online, like if these streaming services, you know, like, like, you know, music ones and, you know, stuff for like uh, TV and movies, if they just went away, what would you have? Nothing. Because you don't have like yeah. the CDs. <laughs> so it's just, you know, it's, it's just wild. It's wild that it's, becoming so popular now and it's i don't know what's going to happen in the future i hope that there's still going to be those yeah. dvd sets if those are still in production then i will see streaming services more as a pro not too many cons so that's where i'm i'm standing on it right now kind of going off of that i want to transition the, the conversation into like the streaming services themselves i don't know if it's just me but as of recently there have been so many that have been like established and founded as of recently, like Paramount plus discovery plus um, maybe like a couple like HBO max. You just have so many, in my opinion, at this point, it seems like another version of cable because there's all these different kinds of like channels, quote unquote, you need to get Disney plus Hulu, Netflix, uh, HBO max, um, discovery plus Paramount plus, there might be another one coming out. I don't know. I'd have to look into that. I feel like there's so many, but it just seems like it's cable and it's like defeating maybe the purpose of what the streaming services were in the first place. What do you think, Ricky? I do understand that notion, um, but I'm always on the fence that you don't have to buy all of those streaming services. You don't have to have Apple TV. Like I never seen anything from Apple content related. No, me neither. Yeah, my life is okay to not go on certain subscriptions and to be like kind of la 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 la. I didn't even know that Pluto TV existed until recently um, mm -hmm. when I was in my um, future TV class for college and subscription service for freemium TV existed since like um, 13. Even as you mentioned, Paramount Plus. That actually existed as CBS All Access for a few years now. Oh, there you go. I didn't even know that. <laughs> it launched when HBO Go originally released. Yeah, now that evolved into HBO Max, but it's better. Mm -hmm. Paramount Plus, yeah. I don't think it's better. That's my personal opinion, just because there's such so much clutter, and it's just kind of a slight upgrade. Granted, they have a lot of Nickelodeon stuff, and that's a significant upgrade, but... At the same time, there's a little bit of gaps in Paramount Plus, and I don't think it was ready to be involved into something like that. I think they should have grabbed all the resources. That's the Paramount Company, Viacom, CBS, and they should have like just put in everything to neat polish it, add the Pluto TV aspect. It would be similar to Peacock, even though Pluto TV did it first, where mm -hmm. you have live TV and a streaming service in the middle and like it's curated tv and that's something is really good um because you don't have to have just but random areas of shows grouped together because you could have something curated like hey you want to watch the ncis channel we're gonna give you everything from this backlog of this show that aired for the last 10 years and my mom would watch that and she would love it because she sometimes just watch old episodes of content just back and forth. And we would too. Like if it was something that we loved. Like if it was the Cartoon Network channel. We would definitely just watch it and binge it. I know like my uncle. He watches me TV. And it's just airings of decade old shows. That he has watched dozens of times. But he loves it. That is curated to his taste. Exactly. And that's where like that niche programming comes in. Because like. I took a history of television and radio class back in college and like they talked about like nowadays it's like a lot of niche programming like like discovery plus is really like hgtv like house stuff food network you know like discovery hands-on like science stuff and you have hbo max it's more like movies and like action crime 
you know, and well, animation's kind of scattered all in between, especially with Disney Plus. That's a lot of animation, just, you know, Disney. But yeah, like I said, it's just niche programming. And like, you know, it's reminded me of kind of like a like a magazine subscription. If you like something specific, then you're going to subscribe to that magazine. That's the kind of parallel that I kind of just noticed now, going to be honest. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, exactly. And what I personally love about it is that you could just buy a TV that has internet has internet capability, have a online, have an internet provider, connect that to the internet. Hey, now you have free channels that you could just watch with ads like you did before. Because that is how yeah. TV works. Mm-hmm. Sorry, that just reminded me of like Peacock and like Hulu. If you don't have the premium subscription, like you still get those ads. YouTube as well. Yeah. Yeah, like exactly. And not to mention, you could just buy like a $12 a month thing if you want to like do it like gradually. If you don't feel like buying it for an entire year. If you like what HBO Max offers and might as well go for the subscription. And if you know that you don't watch a lot of TV, it's like, that's a pretty good bundle, what they provide, at least in my opinion, um, because they provide like pop culture stuff. And what I really, it's like what I like about Paramount Plus about being a nostalgic machine, HBO Max actually is currently <laughs> um, mm-hmm. for better or worse. But yeah, like that's why I really like where we are right now as terms of contact, because they're, there's not loads of contracts you have to sign. Like, I just want to watch my cartoons. Let me watch my cartoons. So there's a lot of streaming services out there. And I kind of want to talk about which one might be our favorite one as of now. I'll start. So I don't think I could choose a favorite streaming service, to be honest. It kind of goes with the whole niche programming aspect. Like, I like animation. I like my action. Sometimes I'm in the mood for some mystery. And those elements are really within a lot of the streaming services anyways. So it depends on the show I want to watch. So I kind of go from like Netflix to HBO Max to Disney Plus to Hulu. Those are my top four. Ricky, what about you? I have so many things to say (laughs) from this one little conversation started. But um. To answer your question, it would have to be a tie between HBO Max and Disney Plus, just because there's mm. so much things to watch with that those two streaming services starting up. Like, guys already came out on streaming. Disney in particular has also been releasing a lot of content for people to watch because of the pandemic. HBO Max as well, for better and worse, of course. And both of those have just provided me the share amount of content where if I just want to watch an old cartoon I watched as a kid I could just go to it or like if I just want to watch something because I'm feeling nostalgic or I want to watch something new because like there's hardly anything new now I feel like and we're just starting to get new content and it's like yes feed me I honestly think that those two are doing a great job I would have to say I would have to say honorable mention for third place would be Amazon Prime. Uh, it shouldn't be as good as it is. By that is, they don't provide a lot of original content, but what they do is actually good. I.e. Yeah. Invincible, The Boys, um, the show The Wild. Like, oh my God, these shows are actually pretty well produced and are making people talk. The Wilds is essentially the Lord of the Fries, but with actual teenagers and with women um, to actually see how would they survive on an island by themselves. And it's a very suspenseful thing because they don't know how they got there. And it's just this whole drama filled thing. The boys is a, what if superheroes happen in all reality and they're celebrities and they're not morally good people. Why Invincible is essentially a, just a comic filled fun thing with no hint of reality it's just a comic book adaption from paid to screen i love that those shows exist and surprised what amazon prime is doing and netflix i'm kind of disappointed in as the years go by one thing i might be interested might look into because talking about jupiter's legacy and then they cancel it 
and now there's no reason for me to watch it. Not to mention, Two Grand Booty. They canceled that one. People loved it. Didn't do the good numbers as Netflix wanted to. And they just canceled it, and now it's on Adult Swim. So it's like all of this thing where Netflix is kind of just slipping up a little bit. With Netflix, I have to say, their strong suit seems to be animation. I watched the Kipo and the Age of Wonder Beasts. I have watched Two Gun Birdie when it was on Netflix. Um, what else? Uh, She-Ra. Cannot forget She-Ra. Um, trying to think of what else. I've heard Hilda was good. Carmen San Sandiego. Uh, I think Kid Cosmic was a good one, too. But there's just a lot of good animation that is on Netflix. And, you know, besides, like, for example, Two Gun Birdie. It's a good show. It just wasn't, like, promoted well. And that's the thing about a lot of streaming services, too. This goes in general. Some of them have so much content, and a lot of it gets, like, stuck within, like, the rest of the content. It's like a needle in a haystack in a way. Or, you know, we can call them the hidden gems. People don't really know about these shows, and it's sad because then they get canceled. Except with, like, Tuca and Birdie, it's being moved, like you said, being moved to uh, Adult Swim. Hopefully it'll have more life there. I just wanted to add that. It's, at least in my experience, it seems to be more animation as the strong suit for Netflix. Yeah, I'm not saying that like Netflix is completely digging themselves in a hole or anything like that. I'm not saying that they're the absolute worst or the new they're the new blockbuster. Like no, Netflix are doing smart decisions. It's more or less that they haven't found their golden goose yet. 100%. A lot of streaming services have this metaphorical golden goose, which is their cash cow is what make people to subscribe. HBO Max, those golden gooses, the DC Animated Universe, Prince of Bel-Air, Friends, of course, and like so many other shows that you would just, everyone would culturally gravitate to. Me and Nat's generation and the generation ahead of us really love those shows that I question. And then they're gonna, when they have children, they're going to watch them and that line of generation will watch those. Even though that Netflix do have hot shows like Bridgerton, Stranger Things, and a lot of other animated content, I don't think that there's enough people that would gravitate to just watch those specific shows. I think you need a direct mindset who we're going to watch Bridgerton, who is going to watch Queen's Gambit. Like these are actual niche shows and Netflix is doing good in the niche market. However, the question is, do you need a broad audience to survive? That's a good question. Platforms like Shudder, they exist perfectly fine. Being in their niche corner of horror and everything of the macabre. But yeah, like, you could just advertise to a niche market. And if Netflix does that, I think mm-hmm. they could survive. Like, I don't think they're going to die anytime soon. But are they going to be the main player at the table? I don't know. I mean, they used to be, but that was a bygone era. It's gone. They were like the first streaming service to like really exist. And kind of going along with that, they just, you know, cater to like a general audience. So they never really found a specific niche. If they ever will, that's a good question. Who knows? Yeah. And they didn't even own the gooses or the general audiences. Other people did. And they were like, okay. Take this. Let's go. Walk, walk, walk. Paddle, paddle, paddle. And then they're the new kids on the block. And those properties left Netflix and went to their respective corporations. For example, Friends went to HBO Max. They have to make, you know, original content. And the thing is, they make a lot of it. And it's like they're trying to, like, see what sticks. Like, they're throwing so much on the wall. And they're just trying to see what sticks. I want to jump in with another streaming service that I think we forgot vrv or maybe it's called verve um that one's really like uh animation at least uh that's what i've gotten from it like bravest warriors is on there being puppy cat a lot of stuff with frederator studios it seems to be um but a lot of those properties kind of just chill out there so that's a that's one that i think not a lot of people remember i'm not sure how it's doing now i used to go on it but now i just don't I used to go on Verb 2. I didn't know it still existed. It's out there, guys. Apparently, just for a little bit of background, it was a collaboration with Crunchyroll and other Time Warner animated corporations. 
And that was a little fun niche little thing for a few bucks. Gradually, the price went up higher and higher. I was a subscriber. I then got out when I, HBO Max was announced. And now I haven't looked back because I could watch basically what was on Verb, which was Looney Tunes, by the way. And now I could watch HBO Max. So, yay. The only reason I was watching Verve was for Bravest Warriors. And I just kind of stopped watching it, I guess. I don't know. I don't know if it's still going on or not. It was still a good show, guys. I will still check it out, but I haven't been back either. I'm sorry, Viv. You just are owned by a stronger company. Speaking of TV, what is going to happen with T television and traditional media? Gradually, the cable that we knew as we were growing up, that's going to die. Unfortunately, some organizations are still holding on to the whole cable aspect. And I have one one specific example here. Disney Channel is releasing new content. Owl House Season 2 is out right now. New episodes. They're only being broadcasted on Disney Channel. They're not going at all to Disney+. Plus. Depending on the country and depending on the household, because some people still have cable, others have the streaming services, not everyone is getting access to these shows. The same goes for Amphibia, or anything really on Disney Channel, that is not on Disney+. And it's just not getting that viewership anymore, because a lot of people are going to streaming. I hope Disney Channel changes how they're doing things, but like as of now, it's just ruining the viewership on the shows, and they're not getting accurate numbers as to how many people actually are interested in these shows. There's a lot of people who like these shows and they just don't have access to the cable, like where it's being, you know, released. So going back to the main picture, a lot of like channels and, you know, they have to be putting stuff also on streaming. I get that you want to stick with the cable as well and good for you because I know I like cable as well, but you have to realize that, you know, we're going into this different era. We're in a digital era now and you have to be putting stuff on streaming as well. So I'm not saying completely go to streaming, but like, you know, kind of to get that gradually going, at least, and instead of denying it in a way. But yeah, definitely. Natalie, you bring up a very good point. Sadly, the main culprit of here is that networks, corporations, conglomerates, whatever you want to call them, still still treat subscription services and broadcast television as two different entities. When they go through ratings, they only look at the numbers for like TV through there. When they look at the ratings for streaming services, now they have a separate um, sheet of paper. And Disney Channel is just the most recent culprit of here. I agree, a hundred percent. You have to see that streaming is, you know, really prominent nowadays, especially in the last five to ten years. It was a huge huge incline with that so it just makes sense to like be putting it also on the streaming i mean in a way i don't know if cable is going to die completely i don't know maybe i'm bad at predicting these these kinds of things so i also want to say before tv was even invented the old entertainment was through radio and you know audio storytelling did that die Not completely. It's like podcasts now. There's a lot of podcasts out there that tell these stories that exclusively are in podcast form. So who's to say? It probably won't die. Video did not kill the radio star. So what makes you think streaming will kill the video star? And that was our discussion of our feelings with streaming services. Being the primary player at the table in regards to how you get your media related content. And a special thank you to the artist Mountain Mayhem Works. They have done a huge favor for us of creating this beautiful artwork that you have seen for this YouTube channel. Please follow them on Instagram if you like their style at Mountain Mayhem Works. Look at their website to see their additional work if you're interested of commissioning Paso projects. It is also in the description. I hope you guys enjoyed our first episode of The Streaming Buds. I'm Mickey. And I am Nat. 
If you'd like, you can follow us on Instagram at the streaming buds, all lowercase, all one word. Ricky and I have a lot of content in store for you guys, so please stay tuned. We will be releasing our archived episodes from Radio DePaul as well, where we talked about many different movies and series. The first episode to be released is our discussion of the documentary The Last Blockbuster. In this discussion, we talked about the relationship between Blockbuster and Netflix, as well as the nostalgic factor of video rental stores. So again, stay tuned for our archived episodes as well. If you liked this episode and want to tune into further discussions, please like and subscribe. Thank you.